Hello everyone, um, this is Christine He. I'm a bioinformatician on the apps team at Oxford Nanopore. And um, today I'm gonna to be talking about ONT sequencing of uh, complex environmental samples. I'll be talking about both a fecal sample and a compost sample. Um, in the first part, I'm gonna go over um, some highlights of methods and sort of recommendations or choices that we found to be effective specifically with environmental samples. And then in the second part of the talk, I'm gonna be talking about the analysis and results from uh, the compost uh, microbiome. Um, so to begin with, on the right is a figure of, um, it's a diagram of the workflow for our compost uh, from wet lab to bioinformatics. And um, I'll be, I won't be going through every method in detail, but I will be highlighting some sort of key decisions that we made that are hopefully helpful for you as well if you're trying to work with environmental samples. Um, beginning with wet lab methods, um, sort of the most critical decision in this part of analysis is, um, of course, DNA extraction, how you're lysing your cells and getting them um, separated from your matrix, effectively extracting DNA. Um, and I think that, you know, there are many extraction protocols out there. And what we found to be particularly effective for a fecal sample or a sample like compost, where there is sort of a complex matrix that these cells are embedded in, is using uh, chemical temperature and mechanical lysis in order to get uh, as unbiased of a view of your microbial community as possible. And of course, this is always balanced with the read lengths that you are expecting to get. So the more mechanical lysis, the more that you're sort of treating your cells um, and your DNA, the more you're going to shear the DNA. And, um, you know, you want as long of read lengths as possible. So there's always a balance there. Um, but on the right, you can kind of see some hard numbers. So these these fragment length distributions are all for um, the fecal sample that we've been looking at. And the top, middle, and bottom uh, length distributions correspond to three, six, and nine minutes of bead beading. And you can see that the N50, or the, the peak of the length distribution, changes from 10 kb to 9.4 kb to 8.8 kb. So that's kind of what you should expect for um, a sample that's similar uh, physically to, to a fecal sample. And actually what we found for the compost is that 10 kb N50 gives quite good results in our opinion for assembly and binning. So um, it doesn't have to be ultra long reads, you know, nothing crazy, although of course that is possible with nanopore technology, but um, 10 kb N50 will give you pretty good results. Um, another important aspect is, of course, sample QC. Environmental samples uh, like fecal or soil can contain compounds that um, can sort of competitively bind to pores compared to DNA, um, can promote pore degradation, premature pore degradation. So you want to look out for those. Um, and there's also, of course, compounds that are often used in DNA extraction, like guanidine HCl, um, the trace of which is shown here, that you want to make sure you are removing before um, downstream processes because they can inhibit enzymatic reactions. So, yeah, just two things to watch out for when it comes to, you know, dirtier environmental samples. Um, in terms of library prep for metagenomic samples, we recommend ligation sequencing as opposed to something like rapid sequencing. Um, this will give you optimal sequencing throughput and accuracy, preserve base modifications, and you have the option of multiplexing up to 96 samples if you use a barcoding kit. Um, on the right here shows sort of a typical read length distribution for um, Promethion flow cell with uh, the fecal sample library. So N50 of around 8 KB and average output of 190 gigs. And um, we always recommend running the flow cell to completion rather than trying to take a sample off and reload and reuse. Um, it's just optimal in terms of throughput. Um, and if 
if barcoding is necessary, I think that that's preferable over um, kind of trying to fit multiple runs into a single flow cell. Uh, now I'm going to focus on the bioinformatics. Um, and I'm going to focus specifically on de novo assembly from metagenomic long reads. And, you know, the question uh, is why assemble your reads? And there's a number of, of good reasons for that. Um, the first and probably most important for many people is that it gives much better taxonomic resolution to have long contigs than um, read-based analysis uh, like Kraken or similar programs. Um, and assembled contigs are really pretty necessary as a first step towards true strain level differentiation in your community, which is something um, I'll talk about some strain level results later with the compost. Um, assembly is also the first a necessary step if you want to have discovery outside of reference databases. So um, de novo assembly is how uh, how researchers are able to discover new groups of bacteria and archaea. And uh, finally, de novo assembly allows you to make functional gene predictions within genomic context, which is critical for certain applications like prediction of biosynthetic gene clusters, which are large and, and co-localized on a genome. So there are a number of different metagenomic assemblers out there, and I just wanted to highlight a pretty recent one that we recommend. It's called Nano MDBG, which is a bit of a mouthful, but it's um, an extension of the larger Meta MDBG assembler that was originally designed for um, PacBio HiFi reads, but has been extended to support ONTR 10.4 plus reads, which are highly accurate. And so um, to use it, you just uh, run Meta MDBG with the in ONT option. And um, I won't I won't belabor explaining nano MDBG because you'll be hearing from Robert James, who's one of the developers later on. But um, basically assembly is performed in minimizer space where minimizers are reproducibly subsampled sets of KMERS. And this is ideal for long reads in many ways and um, really kind of minimizes computational memory and time requirements. After assembly, um, you generally undergo what is called binning, which is the process of grouping contigs into bins or groups that represent uh, a single organism, so originating from a single organism. And this is based on um, a number of metrics like GC content, KMER content, single copy genes, etc. cetera. Um, and just like assemblers, there are a ton of different binners out there. But one recommendation we make um, is that before the binning process, you remove any single contigs that would classify as complete genomes in and of themselves. So by completeness and contamination, single copy gene metrics, um, a single contig that counts as, as a high quality genome, I would remove it from the remainder of the assembly. And this helps prevent overbinning by these binners. Um, and yeah, there are a number of different binners, but we, I'd like to point out one that we particularly like. It's SemiBin2, which is a deep learning based binner. And um, similar to all the other binners, it uses KMER and abundance information to generate bins, but the unique aspect of SemiBin2 is that it generates must link and cannot link constraints between contigs. And this is based on either breaking up a longer contig artificially into smaller contigs that must be linked together, or um, taking randomly sampled pairs of contigs and saying that these cannot be linked. Um, we found that this produces quite good bins, um, but the best results are from combining semi-bin2 with other unsupervised binners, older binners, and then choosing sort of in integrating best bins using something like DOS tool. So now I'm going to talk about the application of these methods towards compost, which is an extremely diverse and complex environmental community, um, has some aspects of soil, but is of course different given the uh, degradation of organic matter. 
And um, so what we did is we applied uh, eight flow cells of sequencing to a mature compost sample, um, eight promethion flow cells at an average of about 190 gigs of sequencing per flow cell. So that comes to a whopping total of 1.45 terabases of sequencing for a single sample. And this is, of course, a level of sequencing that's out of reach for most researchers when it comes to a single sample. Um, but we did this ultra deep sequencing to kind of show the, the limits of what is possible if sequencing depth sort of is not an issue. And um, in this uh, stacked bar plot down here in blue, you can see the assembly and binning results when only one or two flow cells of data are sequenced. Um, and you can see that even with one promethion flow cell of sequencing, you are getting over a thousand uh, mags or metagenome assembled genomes of medium quality or higher, which um, we think is, is pretty fantastic. Um, taking the entire 1.45 terabases of sequencing into account, we ended up binning um, over 5,500 mags of medium or higher quality. And in the Sankey diagram, you can kind of see the breakdown of those mags by contiguity, as well as uh, taxonomic classification by GTDB. Um, I think an impressive number is that uh, over 2,300 of these mags are comprised of a single contig, a lot of them closed contigs, and so um, that's just, that's exactly what you want to see out of binning is that you can assemble and capture um, a genome on a single contig. Um, interestingly, um, here on this uh, relative abundance plot, you can see at the phylum level what are kind of the most abundant groups within compost. And these red dots indicate uh, bins that are un, that are classified at the species level. And based on the distribution and number of those dots, you can see that most of the most abundant bins are unable to be classified at the species level by GTDB, which indicates a pretty high level of um, divergence from genomes that are available in the GTDB database. And in the Venn diagram on the right, we said, okay, let's compare these mags to other other databases that lie outside of GTDB, two of which are the Global Soil Mag Project and the Microflora Danica Project, which are really large terrestrial mag uh, catalogs. And you can see that only 46 species are shared between our compost sample and these catalogs, indicating that, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, diverse and divergent species in there. And also, between the two catalogs themselves, a relatively few number of species are shared, indicating that probably any terrestrial community that you sample is going to have a huge number of uh, sort of unknown species. Um, from this high quality assembly and mags, we were able to do a lot of different uh, metabolic functional analyses that are definitely enabled or bettered by having uh, genomic context. We are able to look for casimes, that's uh, figure A, um, which are carbohydrate active enzymes that are particularly important in compost and the degradation of lignocellulose. And we were able to ascribe different casimes to different groups based on taxonomic classification of those mags. Similarly, we were able to identify thousands of bi biosynthetic gene clusters, which require genomic context to look for um, all of the co-localized genes in a cluster. We were also able to identify many phage defense systems, um, of which there are an increasing uh, number of types that are being discovered um, as we speak, including CRISPR-Cas systems. And then finally, we were able to identify antimicrobial resistance genes. And because we have genomic context based on the assembly and on mags, we were able to assign a good deal of them to either a plasmid or chromosomal origin. Okay, and moving beyond mags, we were 
able to uh, sort of resolve different strains. So out of the compost assembly, uh, one example is that for a single Devosia species, we got three complete, three single contigs that were each represented a complete genome of uh, a of the same Devosia species. And um, importantly, they each have different antimicrobial resistance profiles. So only one strain or one contig had tetracycline resistance um, with this te tetracycline efflux pump. And then the remaining genes for um, resistance had different profiles between the three different strains. So just one example, small example of how um, strain resolution can even just come out of your assembly uh, when you're dealing with metagenomics. Uh, another exciting result is that we're able to look for, find invertons, which are sequences between inverted repeats that can be inverted by enzymes. And it was recently discovered that these can occur entirely within a gene, meaning that maybe in response to environmental stimuli, um, a single protein coding gene can have two different forms that can, can uh, uh, be switchable. And um, we were able to find eight uh, sort of very high confidence invertons in our assembly. And this is because of Oxford nanopore reads that span these inverted repeats that, that pose a challenge for shorter reads. So um, this, this was a pretty, pretty exciting result. Um, beyond what I've talked about here, there's a lot of further applications that are uh, possible for really rich nanopore data. The first is that I want to talk about is DNA methylation. So uh, Dorado, which is the, the base collar for Nanopore, has all context models for 4MC, 5MC, and 6MA, which are the three mods that are primarily found in prokaryotes. And um, a relatively new tool mod kit can find highly enriched modification motifs in your uh, reads or assembly. The second really exciting application is phased haplotypes. So uh, metagenomic assemblers often work by collapsing strain level variation, small level variation into consensus sequences. But there have been two exciting recent programs that can go back into that assembly graph and using long reads can call strain variants and phase them. So connect strain variants across long scales and get haplotypes essentially. Um, one is strainy, which works at the genome scale and another is divider, which works at the gene scale. And so um, just wanted to shout out these tools. I think that anyone working with uh, microbiomes of any kind would be excited to kind of try these tools out and, and uh, resolve strains in their communities. Um, so with that, uh, that is sort of the application of, of ONT sequencing to a compost sample. And um, I'm happy to take any questions during the Q&A.